warm welcoming you all back to this program, ThinkTech Hawaii, and this show, Human Humane Architecture. We are in and disregard last week when I was fake newsing, but the opposite way as it's usually done. I was downplaying things. So we're not in the 240th shows. We're already in the 343rd show. And you're nearing to be our 20,000th viewer, which we appreciate. And we is we are back here from uh, you guys originally neighbors because Peru and uh, Colombia are pretty close. So that makes it Pedro Capriata. Hi, Pedro. Thanks for being back. Hello. And Martin Anzalini here uh, with us uh, in Honolulu. Hi, Martin. So um, it's been a little while, a, a couple of weeks. We had to uh, be timely and use Anchory, and we dedicated the last two shows to uh, someone. But uh, the most important and tragic thing that happened is you see it up there at the top right that our dear guest and, uh, and, and co-host and host for many years, our mid-century modern master, has uh, called it POW and is not with us anymore, at least on Earth. And Martin, you said, what could be the best obituary then as we were counting the 70, uh, 60 plus shows that he has been part of and enriching this program here. So thank you, Ron, and you will always be with us. And on a better note, um, his contemporary, um, a little couple uh, years uh, older than him, Jimmy Carter, we were cheerleading in the last two shows uh, and to um, say, hang in there uh, to get a hundred, which he turned and then which he promised to hang in there one more month to vote for Kamala Harris for president. So we're continuing to be there and cheerleading. So that was the reason why we were out for a little bit, but uh, kind of building upon where we ended, um, this is Jay uh, who, two of us did the last two shows Jay, with us here behind the camera. We were talking about the go-getters and the go-takers. And we, I, we came uh, to the conclusion that uh, some of the developers here increasingly, unfortunately, are go-takers. And so it was, as we found out, or as we, you know, with detective work was Chris Hemeter, that UJ had some very close observation of him. Uh, in particular, and so uh, the the project he went megalomanic, as we said, is the Hyatt, uh, which uh, actually to make it worse, and we put this into context here because people in Hawaii might say, why in the world are we so obsessed with Barcelona? Which, by the way, the the numbers are interesting, guys, because in 2004, so shortly after the turn of the millennium, uh, Pedro, you went there. And then a few years later, four years later, Martin, you joined for a year. So you guys could have, should have met there. And I went there yeah. more recently in 21 and 24. This makes it really interesting number wise. And Jay, you had been checking it out in 65, right before you came here to appreciate the freeing itself spirit, because that was right before that autocrat system was, uh, taken down uh, these autocrat systems. They were so afraid of them coming back all over the world, unfortunately. So while uh, Jimmy again was was a giver and was returning the favor to uh, Chris Hemeter, um, having befriended him, um, and uh, Jimmy gave back uh, that, that favor and in having involved him in his presidential library. But uh, Chris then basically, uh, on top of having built that megalomanic uh, Hyatt, he tore this one here down, which you, Jay, remember when you came here, it was still there for another decade. This was the Biltmore Hotel. This is something we don't do these days um, at all, tear things down. There's a rising awareness of gray energy and try to keep things as much as you can and not tear things down anymore. Why are we so jealous, Pedro, of what you guys keep doing there in Barcelona? There's little show quotes up there. We used to have the international marketplace right across from the Biltmore uh, on uh, um, Kalakaua Avenue uh, towards the mountains there. That one was a Polynesian pop with a lot of uh, these A-frame roofs that we don't have anymore. And some cynical architects here as Bob Yopa from WCIT, they helped tearing this down and then propose out there Malka Makai, Jay, 
to um, make them again, but as sort of, you know, just images and not what they actually do, because why am I dressed as a non guys today? Because I'm going to step away from that one. Because in front of the build more, we have that uh, structure that actually keeps us in the shade and cool. And uh, especially the ones who have gone full circle as you, Jay and myself, uh, bald and our holly skin being really vulnerable to the hot sun that is pre pretend uh, preventing us and protecting us in many ways so this structure came to my mind regarding this one here that we had just stopped talking last time we want to go back a little bit more here you guys explained pretty much but we want to show you the audience some images going with a with what you explained because it is basically a a big roof that is covered with uh, photovoltaics as you guys were uh, uh, explaining pretty uh, well. And Martin, you explicitly, explicitly said here, this is actually a rather kind of a profane industrial marina harbor function uh, below it. But you see, so it's, 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 it's active technology as harvesting electricity, and it's also passively keeping you cool down there. And, and this is a trend, uh, Pedro, your adopted uh, culture um, in, in, in Spain. There's places as Seville, which is even hotter because it's inland. And I stumbled upon this project here, as you can see on my, thanks, Marti Martin, you uh, made me aware of my Deutsche Welle news anchor that I got myself the app, which we recommend to you guys. You can also have it in English, which is the version you have, Martin. And this project here is pretty exciting which is a public Agora project that is very high on keeping yourself cool. You see that uh, dancer down there who basically says we perform in there and it's so many more degrees cooler. And grantedly, it goes on high tech, as you see up there, but it's using kind of ancient technologies that, you know, the ancestors have been doing and basically cooling the air below and then, you know, blowing it through the building. So that's really a, a trend, a movement, Pedro. I, is that fair to say? And it gets hot, right? And increasingly hot with you guys. It, it can get, yeah. The, it seems like the, the summers are getting increasingly hot. And I was just thinking, because I, I just made this connection, I was a couple of days ago, I was close to the Bourne Market. I'm not sure if we're going to show the Bourne Market at any point. But in any case, there's like this... Uh, experimental shade element that's been built and it's it's actually written it's like uh this is a trial no we're trying out new uh, techniques to create areas of shade uh in public spaces so that even if it doesn't work the the sole fact that you can see something like this and it, it's like hey look we're we're trying new things out and we are aware that the that there is there's always been, I mean, it's always been a relatively hot city in, in summer, you know, and we're going to do everything we can to increase the, the shade areas and to try out new new techniques to, 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 to create these spaces. So it wasn't special. It's not specially pretty or, I don't know, to, to be honest, I didn't stop to, to uh, explore the technology too much. It seemed like something really, really basic. But still, I mean, it's uh, so in this sense, I would say that it is part of the of the culture. Very good. And staying in Sevilla for one more slide and going back to this magic year of 2004 when you came and to spend there now this year, two decades in your beloved uh, home away from home city, Pedro. This gets us back a little humorously talking about bald German guys here to that same year of 2005 when this guy who looks like me, but it's not me, um, could be my twin sibling. This is Jürgen Meyer H., a German colleague. When we were both finalists for this young German speaking, um, you know, uh, dating us, being young in 2004, we were on a train going up to the uh, final jury uh, decision for the Young Architects Award. And uh, uh, Jürgen had been nominated with what you see here now behind me and at the second column from the left. Also a very Hawaii project because he was proposing a waterfall pouring out of a entrance canopy in the city of Karlsruhe, which in Germany, which only works for the few summer months, right? And not in winter, it would be icicles coming out of that. 
And I had presented that solid timber school that you see at the very left. And um, uh, Jürgen must have been inspired, I say this eye-winkingly, because at that time uh, he had proposed this uh, very famous rightly so project for the center of Sevilla, which is this big parasol, which he had done with Arab together. And it's, it's this big uh, just roof that's out of wood, engineered lumber. And its basic prime uh, function is once again keeping uh, the keeping you cool. But this project, Pedro, um, has been celebrated for its uh, spectacularity and for its beauty, uh, rightly so, right? And 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 its its keeping you cool is is a, is an integral side effect of being cool, architecturally. If that's fair to. This is another example that a project that was built for being provisional, for being for a certain amount of time, and then it got such a uh, an appropriation from the community, and it became an icon that sti it's still there. It was built out of wood, so wood works, no, as a, a material for even for public spaces, uh, and it, it's still there. Probably they, it will they will take it down again, or probably build it in, a, in another way to ma make it permanent, but. But it is it is a very successful project, yeah, not just from the uh, environmental point of view, but also from from its role of becoming an urban icon. Yeah, as the forum. So, uh, no? Here's the forum again. Speaking of which, but uh, Pedro, you still wanted to go back and say something about it. No, just mentioned that I think a key feature of this project for the success of this project was that it has like a promenade on the upper level. Uh, so this becomes like people, everybody, and I mean, people from Seville love to go up there and, and visit. I, I I actually haven't gone up. I've been there, but I haven't, I didn't have the chance to to get up there. I think the project was not completed when I, when I last time I was in Seville. Uh, but I know for references that this is, it's become like a very popular uh uh, looking point. Uh, so this, of course, uh, encourages you know, the, the people to appropriate it because, of course, it's not only for tourists, it's for mostly for locals. Yeah. So you as a member of guiding architects, that would be a prime thing to guide. And I didn't know about the, the roof concourse. It reminds me of the equivalent in my adopted um, hometown, Munich, which is the uh, celebrated by us over and over again, maybe the best we Germans ever came up with, which dates a half a century ago, that makes you wonder. And that's the 72 Olympics uh, by Günter Benisch and uh, Fry Otto. That also, um, I still have to redeem a voucher from our exotic escapism experts, Susanne, for also a roof mountain climbing tour that they recently added to, to that sort of spectacle of the project. So we go back to the forum um, as you guys can pronounce it better uh, than I have, because it's got the fancy thing on the O. Uh, but it's basically <laughs> probably what what you imagine what it is. And uh, this I just threw in Pedro because you explained and you both said it's actually a part of a larger urban renewal development. And uh, just to encourage you guys to go on Google Maps, which I just did and did the screenshot at the top left. Actually, it looks like a build diagram, right? It's like how you would like uh, basically uh, portray it in a competition or in a proposal with graphics, right? And color coding, it actually looks like a build, you know, drawing, doesn't it? Right? And you, we're alluding to that, Pedro, right? Yeah, it's it's like a a, a utopian project directly translated into into reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to also, it's part of what you see down there when I was approaching it again. I was there in 21 when I took this picture, thanks to our oldest son, uh, Joey, who was working there for a while. So we approached it and then we saw it's also part of this public sunbathing deck here where we want to uh, relate to, if you look close, uh, and it refers to Jay, us last week in the show about nudity and nude buildings and nude architecture and nude people. And em emancipation or revolution, Jay, as you write it, called it, where that was going on when you were there. And, 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 and Barcelona practices that, right? People, both male and female, take the ride and actually demonstrate the ride to be topless. 
and not so much here in Hawaii, although in Hawaii it's uh, way more a cultural practice as the indigenous people practice that. And only when the missionary came, they forced them to throw these mumus on, which is again, climatically inappropriate, you sweat. Um, it is more appropriate to go underdressed. So that's another thing that, that in public life is performed there, is sort of executed. Um, and it's 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 normal, right, for you guys. It's nothing. I mean, here airing this in Hawaii seems shocking, but over there it's just it's just the normal standard, right? Or is there any discussion? I mean, I'm sure there is discussions, but it oh, doesn't no, really the, the only change thing is the that public. Th there are like uh, specific uh, beaches assigned for uh, full nudity, if you yeah. wish. Uh, but beside that, in a regular beach, I mean, you can even see people fully nude in a in a regular beach i mean in, or in yeah. a public this is this is like an urban beach uh actually um you mentioned that this is like a a place for sunbathing but you see that there's like a ladder there to go down into th this is part of the sea actually not like a bay but it's uh, enclosed so it works as a swimming pool yeah yeah so uh, yeah so i think i would say that that's totally become part of uh of the normality here in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. Not in Peru. <laughs> there you go. How about back in Colombia, Martin? No, not even. We have most still, American, still, the American... Uh, still working COVID. on it. I mean, Germany, I shared uh, with you, Jay, last time, you know, certain cities actually started in Göttingen where we were doing the kind of trying to be nude, uh, you know, preschool for the university, uh, women have fought in court and won successfully to be able to be um, emancipated as men, topless in public pools. And it has spread all over Germany, including our capital in Munich. So just join that movement uh, back at your home cultures and countries. So, and then walking back, you find um, places um, uh, for, recreation for having a coffee, having a snack in these uh, beach pavilions. You see one post and you see us in the shade. So, and there isn't just one, there's actually, uh, you know, a sequence of them. It's kind of a serial type or a module that's repeated, you know, every so many intervals along the beach. We're at another one at the top left. And back in Honolulu, we got to be jealous of that uh, because De Soto just taught us, uh, show quote at the bottom left in this great new show, how did we get here, that there was a Spence Cliff restaurant chain and they operated, including many on the beaches, which was Queen Surf, uh, Martin, which is in your new front yard, which is next to my front yard here, we're neighbors now, and the Tahitian yeah. Lanai further down the coast, and we don't have these anymore. And even, you know, uh, bringing up news anchory, another subject matter, because when uh, you and I, Martin, were walking to the uh, obituary mem memorial service at the Art Rigger Canoe Club for our other friend, Rich Lowe, who we lost, um, I must have sensed uh, that our friend Ron Lindgren was knocking on my shoulder and because I turned around. And by this time, he was physically already gone a week, which I didn't know yet. And I, it must have been him uh, bringing that finger rainbow down, rainbow finger of his and pointing down into his Hali Kolani. Um, and uh, I also, because he was always very, very good in everything and being on top of news and the hurricane Helen had just plowed through Florida. And at the, the picture at the bottom, I called Florida style for that reason, because Actually, seawater level rise had just been eroding that and, and under uh, digging uh, that, that sidewalk. So we're also talking, and uh, right now as we're talking, the next category five, Milton is approaching poor Florida again, the troubled tropics, the fellow troubled tropics. And I was just looking up, uh, Pedro, uh, you're not saved from that either. I think four years ago, not that the names matter, but I think there was Gloria, right? There was plowing through Barcelona pretty heavily. So, was, no? Yeah, compared yeah. To, so, to hurricanes in the Caribbean, it was <laughs> just a storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but see what a level rise I also looked up at the prediction, the numbers I remember is in... For 2150, uh, which is still some years ahead, but they're predicting up to 1.4 meters, which makes it like, you know, five up to five feet. And given 
the city is right on sea level, right? That's basically going to make everything that's going to be streets right now being submerged just as well, right? Yeah. No, this, this brings us also to, to, the, to the similarity within these two cities and many others in the whole world about how cities are dealing with their borders, their seashores, no? Uh, I remember 20 almost years ago in Barcelona, the, the point about raising the, the the height of the decks at the port. Also, uh, all many of the beaches, as, as Barceloneta, Pedro could tell, could, could tell better than me, are somehow built. Every year they bring sand and they, they reshape them. It is a landscape, it is not nature. Um, so how these cities are getting ready to, to, to receive climate change, I mean, the consequences of climate change, uh, some, in some cases, make them become an opportunity. No, uh, I think Barcelona is doing pretty well because all everything that is happening in, here in Honolulu, we are very generous with the borders. I mean, it is mandatory for any development, Pedro, this is very interesting, to uh, guarantee the access to the beach. It, it, is, it, it is forbidden to privatize the seashore, which is amazing uh, uh, for, for, for the cities. Uh, 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 for an American city, uh, American about I'm talking about the continent of America. Uh, in, in Europe, it's more common to to make parks along the water bodies, uh, and but here we are lacking this opportunity of really providing services, as the barefoot cafe and other cafes. In many cases, the only the only spaces for being able to get to the water and have a be beer in front of the water or eat in front of the water or even have any kind of public services. It is restricted to mainly, mainly to hotels. No? So uh, you can access to the beach, but you, but it's hard to get services if it, if, if it is not just being part of a hotel or something. So it's kind of a this like good and bad uh, situation. Uh, but then yeah. again, uh, th there are like in both cities there are very positive examples of how to deal with with seizures and how to deal with seizures in 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 a context of climate change here there are also some exper experiments uh, having uh, having uh, being made about how are we dealing with coral reefs and then to beaches uh, 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 alamedas malecones so all these spaces sorry for using the words in spanish the the paths along the along the water as as we as paseo Cono that we were talking last time that we were meet were meeting and and you were uh, again saying you know have something to eat something to snack i mean that's not only sustaining us as as human engines but it's also gives us a chance to um get socially in touch right so this this is about public spaces so let's look further into food as a as a catalytic converter for that one and go to a next typology of markets here so we have mainly chinatown as the main place where our markets are and this typology, we stumbled in as a firm some years ago and uh, then getting into these publications here. These are basically grocery stores and the predecessor project of that one um, in, in these publications. And the inaugural pu publication has a funny angle to, to Barcelona and to the market that we want to look at because the author Christian Campus uh, was basically at some point struggling and saying, Martin, I, I don't think we can continue to do the book. I don't find um, enough, um, you know, projects. So I charge myself and while I talk, you can read and get yourself amused by his little acknowledgement there at the beginning of the book. I basically said, come on, uh, Christian, I will then feed you together with my research assistant, uh, Jameson, who's mentioned up there. And we fed him, you know, each week with more projects. And by, at some point, we even ran out and we just said, hey, maybe we want to open up the scope. And I mentioned this example here, the Santa Catarina market. And, you know, his answer was, oh, Martin, yeah, you just have to, I guess, um, it's actually, I, I, not only do I look at it every day because he had his office there, his editorial office, but this is where I go down to and have my, have my lunches. And I basically said, okay, um, Christian, you're on your own now. You just got to open your eyes and, you know, <laughs> a whole new, you know, realm of projects pours into you. How, how, you know, that's a very funny one here. So anyway, so that project here talking about that magic year of, uh, again, the early 2000s, 
uh, was just uh, coming and be completed when you came, Pedro, and it was fairly recent uh, when you, Martin, came. So you are the utmost experts from the get-go. So please share with us, uh, the, you know, how this project, you know, um, was was perceived, of course, by yourself and by the public. Um, should I start? <laughs> Uh, please, you have much more to say. <laughs> uh, this, I think, this is a this has been a very successful project in almost all levels. Uh, generally, architects appreciate very much the the project. I think the public also. Uh, and one thing that it's managed to do so far, it didn't have this problem at first, but uh, now it's becoming more more popular with tourists. So the thing would be to hope that it doesn't turn into what the Boqueria market turned into. The Boqueria market is basically half of the shops in there uh, just sell, for example, prepared food and fruit juices and things that are uh, like in 80% destined to tourists. And this uh, still isn't the case of the same uh, Santa Catarina market. Uh, I've always liked very much the project, and I even had the chance uh, to to shop there uh, relatively frequently. I was living; it wasn't the closest market to to my home, but I like it so much that once in a while I made an effort to go to walk a little more, you know, uh, and and go to this place. And I still remember some of the stores. It has great uh, the seafood, you know, is great here in Spain uh it has very good fruit very good cheeses and i think it's a it's a very interesting project one of the only things that i personally find a little um not of my it's not one of my favorite things is the uh the connection between the old building and the new building because i don't know if you know the story of this market it's a it's a 19 an early 19th century uh market that was um, built before the typical uh, iron structure markets uh, was defined, at least in, in Barcelona. Uh, so it had like an older system and uh, authorities didn't consider that it was worth saving except for the facade, which you can see this old facade uh, that we can see in white is not spectacular, frankly. I mean, it's okay, but it's uh, uh, if you compare it to other markets in Barcelona, no, it's it's not particularly uh, striking. Uh, so I always thought that the relationship between the new structure and this uh, enclosure, that since it's only the enclosure, no, it seemed like a little. Um, I don't know. I I prefer, frankly, the rear facade, <laughs> which is uh, completely new. No, rather rather than this one, but still, I think it's a it's an interesting approach, you know, to how we deal with old things. And uh, another extra thing that I would like to add is that the this market was built in the 19th century on top of a uh, of a monastery, a former monastery that had been expropriated by the crown. This was a practice that was started in Spain relatively early in the 18th century uh, of expropriating some. Uh, uh, some church properties and turning them into public buildings, which is something pretty interesting. You know? So we have a little part of the market where we can still see the ruins of the monastery, uh, but just a little part because they had to do, uh, and that's going to connect with the, with these images because they had to do, uh, they had to destroy actually the rest of the monastery ruins, which were not that, um, uh, it wasn't that important from an archaeological point of view. Uh, but it was necessary for the market to keep working because the strategy in most public markets now that ha are being renewed in Barcelona is that uh, they built a new underground level and they put all the services down there. So all the delivery, for example, of groceries, uh, the trucks come in and out, uh, the garbage goes in and out, well, out mostly. Um, mm. So uh, all of this happens in an underground level and it happens in the St. Catherine market in which case it was a little easier maybe to do that because they just um, they made a register of all the ruins. They decided we're going to keep this little part and then the rest they just uh, tore it down and uh, built the new uh, the new basement level. And for example, in this market that you're showing, uh, they did the same thing, but they kept the complete uh, structure. This is a, one of these examples of a beautiful 19th century uh, structure that, of course, uh, the city council decided to to preserve um 
completely, let's say, you know, there were a little, maybe a little details that were changed. But in this case, they had to uh, create a new underground level, preserving the the original structure, no? which is a, a really, they th I think they did a pretty amazing task. Yeah, this is, by the way, yeah, Martin, you go. There is also, uh, I remember that there is a house for, for elderly in the back part of the market, right? A new house that Mirage yes. also designed, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a social housing project, kind of. Yeah, that's that's super interesting, also, no, because it's a it's a combination. Of, it's it's a it's a new market that uh, I think it's also important to mention that there is like a whole network of markets in Barcelona that is very uh, very strong, no, and very uh, people usually buy their things still, no, in spite of supermarkets, etc. People still go a lot to markets. Uh, and you mentioned, Martin, that your friend went to eat there, for example, and this is, it's also uh, like a social place, uh, a place of uh, meeting people as well. You can talk with the, with the vendors and people just get together for coffees or for, uh, or for lunch because there are a few coffee shops and restaurants uh, within, the, uh, within the market. And I think you make a good point because these projects of ours are exactly what you've been talking about. They're community grocery stores. So they provide this sort of network. America once had that in its heydays and we still have it in Honolulu with some, you know, uh, you know, basically foodland stores. And there's some beautiful architectural ones. I'm just working on the descriptions for, our, um, you know, talking, guiding architects. I don't know if you're familiar, Pedro, with uh, the DOM publisher series. It's a German couple, um, Philip and Natasha Moisa, who um, have, uh, I think, 200, up to 200 guides out. I mean, uh, you know, uh, guide books. And we're, we were asked to do the Honolulu one. And so um, I'm... Uh, Again, I, we put one in that is by Pete Wimberley, which is the Windward Mall out there, which is a very googly uh, architecture from mid-century. So architects basically were able to enjoy themselves, you know, within constraints of these are not fancy projects. Um, so this is, by the way, so you see Pedro in action here as the guiding architect <laughs> next to me, because that's how we met about a few months ago in the summer. And you were giving us the tour and uh, you walked us through this project here, which was not part of the official program, but you used it as to walk us through and you were very, very uh, enthused about it. You were talking about Berlage as a reference from, you know, and, and very, very engaged. And you see us here, here's Joey, Lenny and Clara. And, and thanks for that, Pedro. That was very, very, uh, very engaging. Yeah, and I mean, just to illustrate, you know, there's there's a guy walking. I, I'm using, uh, there's a, sib a similar sibling picture from uh, Chinatown here where a guy walks a whole pig into it, but I can't find it. So I, you have to trust me on that one. But this is like the real life. This is not like faking it. And food, by the way, is affordable. I mean, relatively speaking, I have my bill here next to me that was like five bucks for for coffee and for something sweet to nibble on. Uh, you don't even, with Starbucks, you don't even get any kind of coffee anymore, right? Um, uh, anywhere close. So it's all capital concentration, as you, Jay, call it correctly in, in, that, in that segment as well. You talked about, uh, you can actually, you know, tourists don't buy, you know, usually fish, but local people do. Um, and so that's, that's all part of that kind of market. And again, it was... Uh, a very uh, Martin, you said that it's architect, uh, you know, the male part, uh, Enrique Mirales passed away too early in his life and his partner is carrying on um, the, the practice as we're speaking and we touched on them. This is a project here you've been sort of on touching on, Pedro. Um, I mean, the typology, which is now another one where it's not food primarily that you, uh, that you basically offer, but it's actually what we have here as well. I should have been throwing in um, a picture of the swap market we have out at Aloha market, uh, Stadium out there, out west. So it's outsourced into the burbs, so to speak. So people have to drive there. But this is pretty close in, in, in the city still. It's next to this new neighborhood that we talked about when we were talking about the high rises. You see um, there 
uh, the Torah Akbar by Novell sticking out there uh, to the left. So share with us more um, because uh, only you know it, Pedro. Martin, you had already left uh, by the time in 13 when it was built. But Pedro, you were just there and just finished your first decade in uh, Barcelona when it was built. So share with us. Yeah, and it's a building we usually include in, in our tour of the of the neighborhood, of the 22 at neighborhood in, in Barcelona that includes the, the Glorious Tower and several buildings that you see behind. So it's a building I've I known pretty well. I've even been there a couple of times to to shop things. I used to work also in the neighborhood for many years. So I'm I'm familiar with the building and its surroundings. Uh, this is a very uh, unique project because it's actually a flea market. And it's a flea market with a very uh, striking structure. The a flea market existed in this neighbor in this area, uh, like one or two blocks away from here. And uh, there was this project to remodel the whole plaza and turn it. It was really never a plaza. It was supposed to be a plaza, but uh, this this area that we see behind, uh, and now it's being turned into a large park. And when they, along with this project of uh, creating this new park. Uh, they said, well, what are we going to do with the flea market? So they literally, in this case, asked the neighbors what they thought, which is a thing that we, it's okay to do once in a while. Sometimes when we ask too many, uh, all the time, the neighbors, what do you want? Uh, we get to an impasse. No, they, there was, we had a situation like this with, uh, with a tram project that was um, stopped at one point because it was a tie between those who were against and for and eventually another mayor came in and said listen uh, we need to do this tram project and we're going to do it and that's it i mean i'm not gonna um, put this to vote again um but in any case the flea market existed in this area and the neighbors decided or voted for it to be maintained in the neighborhood so they moved it like one or two blocks to this new structure and the city council went to this uh uh, took a bet on this uh, very fancy looking structure that on the first hand, it covered the market because it used to be like a completely open market. Uh, and at the same time, uh, well, the kind of the idea was we'll harbor the, the flea market, but if we can turn this into some kind of uh, tourist attraction to uh, even better, and it's actually working. Uh, there's a fair amount of people uh, that, you can tell that they're foreigners and they come here to to visit out of curiosity. Uh, I've even had people that, on my tours that said, please, please, can we have 15 minutes to to buy things? You know? And they start wandering around the shops you know? and, and sometimes they come they come back with, with stuff they found. So uh, you can have a little bit of everything. Uh, there's even auctions that take place on the on the lower uh, level. You know, which is like a kind of like a sunken plaza. The, the building takes advantage of um, of a slope. Uh, so it creates like these, uh, it exaggerates the differences of level to create uh, these whole, uh, this whole array of levels that kind of uh, go around this sunken plaza. And uh, a very interesting detail also is the, the that the rooftop is, a ref is reflecting and it's kind of made by bent elements, kind of like an origami uh, plane. And uh, the the interesting thing, of course, when you're in there, you can look up and you see the color of the movement, but you can also spot it from a distance. So it kind of works like a sign. And it's interesting also because this market isn't open every day. So the days it is open, you can tell from a distance if the market is open or not. Yeah, and we want to, um, we're nearing the end of the show time, but we want to finish this up here uh, so we can start fresh uh, next time going into our most pressing uh, topic or back into which is housing, uh, housing the people and the masses. This is a huge thing that we both share in a tragic way in Honolulu and in Barcelona. But because before we close this up here, you already been sharing, Pedro, uh, you know, events uh, that we had the Olympics back then. There was a big boost. There was other, I mean, the forum, there was this big, you know, convention um, of international culture. And you are currently having the, uh, is it is it still on or is it already over the 37th America's Cup? Uh, it, it's know, still on. And, and I think it's still it's on. We're actually so. entering the, the actual America's Cup uh, phase, because I don't know if you know, it's, it's an extremely complex system. And there's like a series of pre-cups 
and uh, parallel events, etc. No, so uh, I think we're entering the the final phase of the. I think I can't put my. I'm not 100 percent sure because yeah. At one point, I tried to to understand what was going on, and I was like, okay. Uh, there are lots has, of books and on its name, like Louis Vuitton, Rolex, and this kind of. Yeah. Things. Yes. There's there's the Louis Vuitton cup. I think that one is over. The Louis, I think the Louis yeah. Vuitton cup is. Yeah, over. it and is starting. Thing, yeah gives me the chance to segue because um, this shows uh, this shows how these shows work, or we hope they work. You uh, told us about what's all going on and the projects that you know are incubated by this event. So I started to fish in the web and the World Wide Web, and I found this project here that you kind of touched on or along the lines. But uh, since we have to wrap up, uh, you were talking Louis Vuitton and on the opposite end that is actually more of interest for us, which is the inclusive versus the exclusive. This little project here, talking provisionary Martin as with, uh, you know, Jürgen's project in CV, but this on the, on the other end, a very kind of uh, low budget, uh, low tech project I found very intriguing. And I'm not sure if this is still actually up because it was described as being, you know, maybe not anymore. So even better that I captured it these uh, <laughs> few years ago now. And uh, I found this really rather compelling as a sort of a very creative pavilion um, uh, that also you see someone down there um, inhabiting it. So this is what we like to call the uh, urban nomads. So the homeless, the houseless, which, um, and this pavilion was sort of not in a commercial way. The other projects try to do, however, in a very inclusive way, as you greatly got across, Pedro, these projects. Uh, but this one here was more, more pointing out into the direction. And this is also done by colleagues who, uh, as I found out down there, who are also engaged in the academe, as it should be, as you, Martin, should work here as an architect and enrich us not just scholarly, but also architecturally, as you should do, Pedro, in Barcelona, right? You guys should all be engaged in projects. And um, that gets me to the one that comes to my mind here mostly, who is our friend Bandit Kanikakon, who um, did this great project along the same lines, which he calls talking elections coming up here, presidential, the White House. It's a small installation uh, with a neo-indigenous material of only two by four. So the all American, you know, stud frame system, how we build houses and even, you know, for, you know, little frame buildings, commercial buildings, strip malls. And he was putting this together in a very kind of a creative way, because once again, uh, in the next uh, couple of shows, we're going to also keep making us jealous here in Honolulu, how you, Pedro, uh, uh, in your adopted hometown city, get things really, really right when it comes to socially responsive uh, urban housing. There's, so there's very interesting projects, but still not enough, I think. So this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, that, that's a good problem to have compared to us here because we don't have anywhere close to enough. <laughs> so that actually gets us back to uh, next week already and starting with that. And that's gonna be several shows because there's so much good stuff that we were, uh, you know, fishing uh, both in in 21 and 24, and to be continued. So uh, thanks for today, um, and uh, see you all for that next week. And until then, please stay very civic and civil. <laughs>